Hello, I'm Mir Hassan. And I'm Waleed Shahid. And you're listening to Black Party. A show about the progressive legislators taking over the Democratic Party from the inside and the movements upending the party establishment from the outside. Today, we're going to keep it simple. You know, not a group chat. It's more of a, what do you call it if it's just one and one person talking? <laughs> a monologue. A monologue. Just a regular text. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> a regular text thread. <laughs> you know when you text yourself something to remind yourself? You ever do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, honestly, is an accurate description of, <laughs> I feel like, our chats. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one person <laughs> dropping random links. <laughs> and that person is well lead. <laughs> With no context. <laughs> All right, Amir Hassan, political director, Justice Democrats, on the mic, who's with me, none other than Walid Shahid, a very senior Democratic strategist, a spokesperson for Justice Democrats, a newly minted Astro Girly, the query season's around the corner. Three days. Oh, three. Dude, I didn't even know that. Walid is I beating me yesterday. at this Astro thing. Wow. You think I didn't prep for this? I saw that we were discussing wow. astrology. Slowly turning this into an astro podcast, my real goals in life. Okay, Walid, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm well rested from our long weekend. I'm a little offended. Offended? What's that? I'm still a newly minted astro girly because I feel like I've been <laughs> on it for a minute. And I know that January 20th is, you know, when the year of Aquarius starts. So I feel like you just turned the corner. I feel I've like you just left. I've amplified. You like, you left. <laughs> Enneagrams, you know, just now, <laughs> and now are like fully committing to the Astro Girly bit alongside me. So <sighs> it's a bit, you know, I'll just do it for the fans. Uh, Amira, <laughs> yes, how are you? I'm good. I mean, Walid, I feel like we have we have so many exciting news. Yeah, we have some exciting updates. This is the beginning of season three of Block Party. You'll be hearing from one or both of us as your hosts for each episode. You'll hear more from the Justice Democrats, Organized for Justice, Block Party staff. And we are moving to a bi-weekly schedule and are ready to commit in 2023. Amira, are we ready to commit? I'm ready to commit. Are you ready to commit? Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, <laughs> Spoken like a true Aquarius, you know, we got a little commitment issues here and there, but we're working on it. We're going to bring you guys consistency, new year, new us, new season, you know, we're, we're ready. And there will also be block docs from our video team to watch on our off weeks when we don't have the podcast coming out. There will also be a newsletter to sign up for. And so please look for us in your feeds on Thursdays for one week of an episode and one week of block party videos. Mira, what's going on today? Today, today's episode, lots of history making, good or bad, humiliating things that occurred at the start of this year. And we wanted to do a deeper dive into McCarthy's rough, rough, very rough ascent to power. We ask ourselves some questions. Are there lessons the left can take from the Never Kevins until, I guess, sure, whatever, I'll vote for him, Kevins. Um, and we take a deeper dive into this humiliation up and down C-SPAN, which was incredible, must-watch television. The Freedom Caucus in all of its glory. And we discuss how translatable hardline tactics are to progressive power building in this particular moment. And in the second half of this episode, we're going to go behind the scenes, the making of Summer Lee goes to Washington, and so does Block Media. I get the honor of talking to Emma Dessau and Jeremy Flutt about their chaotic 14-hour day filming, never-ending history-making moments several times over. Woo! Let's go. Okay. All right, Amira. I want to hear about Kevin. Oh, we need to talk about Kevin. But I was surprised you referred to him by his, by his royal name, McCarthy. I thought we were just doing first names, but... So it's like a the like writing rule, you know. First time around, you get your first name and then your yeah, full yeah. name. Kevin, first of his name, first queen of, of the <laughs> Andals. Uh, uh, okay, give us a quick rundown, Amira. Typically, the speaker's vote is all pomp and circumstance, pageantry, everything settled months in advance, and then it's just for the cameras. Very quick, people make their speeches. But this year was different, uh, which I want to hear why it was different from, from your perspective, but we always forget that there's never just one Sith Lord. 
the Sith are always competing with each other for supremacy. And one of these days, I will watch Star Wars and really understand these references. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Every Congress, at the start of a Congress, which is at the end of every two years, a new Congress forms. They have to choose a speaker and then adopt the chamber's rules and procedures. Mm -hmm. You have to choose a speaker. The speaker, once voted in, swears in new members of Congress, and then they can get on with their business. One of the r ways that they choose a speaker is by voice vote, and everybody has to be present. You can't basically legally function as a Congress until those things are done. And the Republicans won the majority, so they were the ones that had to organize themselves to elect a speaker. It was a historic, unhistoric moment because this was the most amount of rounds to elect a speaker since, like, before the Civil War. And the only time in post-Civil War era that it took multiple rounds to elect a speaker was, like, 1923. So basically 100 years. And that, that was only, like, nine rounds. So the fact that it took 15 rounds to elect Kevin McCarthy and that he muscled his way through every step of this humiliating act didn't just make for good tv but it was it was shocking nobody i think people expected it to go multiple rounds but i think they thought at most like four or five i don't think anybody could have expected it mm. to last as long and I, i think especially on the first day when he went from the second to the third round he like lost some people so that really set it off to really make it seem like it was gonna be you know maybe he wouldn't possibly get it but i mean what really saved him was that there was never an alternative person who could actually compete for speaker Amir, what's been interesting to me is that ever since I started paying attention to politics, Kevin McCarthy has been not just associated with the Republican establishment, but he's also a figure associated with the far right and the hard right pre-Trump. And so Kevin McCarthy and the Freedom Caucus have a lot of history together. McCarthy was one of the first people to embrace the Tea Party movement, and he even brought John Boehner to a Tea Party rally back in the day. You want to go into that history a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I think to really understand what occurred, I think you have to look at McCarthy's like history within the party. I mean, he's a California Republican who rose up the California ranks, and he really actually was the creator behind this trio of Republican up-and-comers back in the day. They dubbed themselves the Young Guns. They even wrote a book that I read for this podcast. <laughs> and White guy they squad. Were, I mean, yeah, I mean, they were slightly different than the squad and slightly different than the Freedom Caucus because mm. they were within the realm of leadership and uh, right, right, were right. really young. They were young, you know, new hopefuls who were supposed to take over leadership in the Republican Party. It was Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor, And Kevin McCarthy. Paul Ryan was the brain. Rest in power. <laughs> Cantor was the leader. And McCarthy was the self-dubbed like, strategist, right? And they really were looking and fighting to win back the majority in 2010. So here's the ad that the Young Guns uh, cut for their book, where they really introduced themselves as a concept. And it is must-watch television. There is a better way. And a new team is ready to bring America back. Eric Cantor, Kevin McCarthy, Paul Ryan, joined by common sense conservative candidates from across the country. Together, they are ready to make history. Together, they are the Young Guns. Innovative, energetic, forging new solutions. One book will outline a vision <laughs> to restore America's prosperity. Amazing. Fine. I love how their YouTube, <laughs> YouTube page is still up from 12 years ago. So wait, but this but you're saying this was like trying to bridge Republican establishment with the yes. far right Tea Party. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. They saw the energy, right? They mm -hmm. were like, look. There is this energy here. We can use that. We can use this energy to catapult us back into the majority. They decided to bring this Tea Party anger to the house, and they set up a super PAC, and then they also set up an action fund, and they found these candidates to support. 
and like mentor and they would go to their districts and teach them how to basically run a campaign. And a lot of the people who self-dubbed themselves as young guns ended up coming into Congress and they did mm -hmm. end up winning the majority back, right? And then a lot of those people in 2014, well, at the start of 2015, formed the Freedom Caucus. Mm -hmm. So McCarthy actually has a lot of history with some of these members like Jim Jordan. Their history is long, but also complicated. So Mira, what I'm hearing you say is that Kevin McCarthy's journey to the Speaker's gavel didn't actually start with the last Congress. He was at one point considered the heir apparent after John Boehner got chased out of town and Eric Cantor, who was supposed to be the next speaker, lost his primary race to a Tea Party primary challenger. You know, the cookie has been crumbled, as you should say. <laughs> the cookie has say. been crumbling for quite a long time, <laughs> yes. And there is a big difference between Eric Cantor and Kevin McCarthy, right? Kevin was not a true believer in the conservative cause, necessarily. Right. Kevin McCarthy is a survivor. Sticks his finger in the air. He's a, he puts his finger in the air. He goes where and he mm. needs to go to have a really long career. He's good with member management. He's a prolific fundraiser for them. And he invests early on in people's careers. And, you know, he's smart in a lot of those ways. But ultimately, people didn't, unlike Eric Cantor, people really believed Eric was like a conservative. And they the, the Freedom Caucus actually believed in and Eric as a as a leader, um, they didn't feel that same way about MacArthur, re regardless how much money he poured into people's races or, you know, how how much he remembers people's like birthdays and wedding anniversaries, and he realizes I won't really get the full support. And at the time, they had a pretty large majority, right? They had like two hundred forty seven Republicans, so very different world. But he he was like oh, I don't want to force this. I will just step down. And there's this amazing clip. He does this press conference and he, you know, he's like, hey. The one thing I've always said to earn this majority, we're servants. We should put this conference first. The one thing I found in talking to everybody, if we are going to unite and be strong, we need a new face to help do that. Uh, we fought hard to win this majority and turn this country around. I don't want making voting for speaker a tough one. I don't want to go to the floor and win with 220 votes. I think the best thing for our party right now is that you have 247 votes on the floor. If we are going to be strong, we got to be 100% united. Wait, so, so Amir, connect the dots for me. When he's giving this speech then, or he's giving this press yeah. conference then, saying he doesn't want to be disruptive and win, he right. d like not win with right. unanimous support. Right. Like how, how does that lead into what happened a couple weeks ago? I feel like he had eight years worth of regret in his heart, right? Because mm. then he was like, I'm going to put the party, the caucus mm. before anything else, before my ambitions. And I am going to step aside and find this acceptable unity leader who can lead all the factions of the Republican Party. And... Fast forward eight years in the making, he has so much time to possibly change the course of his relationships with the Freedom Caucus. But then we get we get to 2023. And honestly, he had the exact same, the exact same issue that he had in 2015. And mm -hmm. this time he decided and he made the choice that he would rather have a bruising humiliating and drawn out battle on the house floor than step aside because ultimately he was like there is no other name really being floated back then he could have made probably the same choice probably would have reached 220 votes a lot <laughs> sooner and it would have probably been less embarrassing but he didn't make that decision i just i i think that that is to me it shows the lack of actual movement within the i think republican conference because they had 2015, 2023, and you have the exact same dynamics play out once more. Freedom Caucus opposing Kevin, right? It's the never Kevins. But in those eight years, they also didn't find a new name, a, a, an alternative person to put up. And I, that says a lot about the Freedom Caucus in general. For people who are fans of Star Wars, they, these Republicans really roll like the Sith. Like they're constantly, uh, there's always two, and then the one is always eating the other. Yes, that is the perfect description. <laughs>
Right, because at the time, the person that everybody in the caucus had in 2015 had decided was the man for the job was Paul Ryan. And Paul Ryan lasted a whole, what, like two years? And then... (laughs) And then he was the wonder boy. Slid away. He was the wonder boy. He was like he was the he was a policy guy. He was the smart one who was you know that everybody agreed really had his heart in the game and truly was a real. He was a true believer in cutting social security. <laughs> I was Medicare. gonna say he woke yeah, up every day in his life and was like, I <laughs> am going to cut these programs. You know, these that old was, people that was, have to die. They they have to go. And he didn't last in the job. He didn't, you know, he went the same way as Boehner. And nothing really has changed in any of those dynamics. Well, what I'm interested in is, you know, over the past 10 years in the Republican Party and the conservative movement, we all have seen that the far right has become stronger, larger, more emboldened. And I was reading this article in Grid about Mm -hmm. how a week after the midterms, there was a group of far-right Republicans led by Andy Biggs and Matt Gates, who met up with a bunch of far-right activists to talk about how they wanted to create a European-style coalition government run by three groups, the Democrats, the Republicans, and the Freedom Caucus. And as someone who is Twitter's number one cosplayer (laughs) of parliamentary politics in the United Mm -hmm. States... Hashtag Borgen, watch that show on Netflix. I was curious what you thought. Did they win anything in this fight with Kevin? What was this fight about? Are there lessons Mm -hmm. to learn from these tactics? Did they actually Mm -hmm. work like a parliamentary faction, a parliamentary party? We've been talking on the show for two seasons about these different blocks in Congress. And Mm -hmm. we saw a block trying to flex its leverage to gain concessions. I'm curious what what you thought of the strategy, the tactics, and the outcomes. Yeah. To be honest, the rules package that McCarthy and his team shared already back on January 2nd, so before the official speaker's vote, largely that that rules package and the one after the 15 rounds of humiliation were largely the same. So I I think my hesitation with with the discourse is basically when people prop up the Freedom Caucus or these Never Kevins as having been so effective, you know, getting these huge concessions and like they did such an amazing job and their hardline ways worked so well because look at all the things they got. I think there are things that Republicans do that are, I think, tactics we should take a closer look at. But I also got to, we also got to look at the outcomes. And to me, the outcomes were not all that different from what they already had and probably would have gotten and probably did get even before they won 15 rounds. You know, as David Dan, who's a journalist at the American Prospect, you know, pointed out several times this fact about the rules packages being pretty much the same. And that the only big change really was lowering the threshold for the motion to vacate. Amir, motion motion to vacate might not mm-hmm. be something that I don't even fully understand what it is. So can you explain to us what they... You, you're saying that's the biggest thing they want. So can you explain to us what that is? Well, it's one of the biggest things, right? It Essentially, this is just a procedural modification to the rules. Basically, you need one member to make a motion to vacate against the leader, the speaker. Mm -hmm. And Democrats had changed that to a threshold that was much higher. You had to have the conference leaders bring this motion to vacate. But before they did that in the 90s, 2000s, majority of the time is basically you just need one person to go and say, I'm filing this motion to vacate the speaker's office. The, The biggest other thing that I think that people really said that they won on, which I disagree, it was this about how hard Republicans would go against the debt ceiling. And why I quibble with that particular aspect is because McCarthy had already said in the fall that he was going to go all in on stopping the debt ceiling being raised, right? This is October 18th, 2022. McCarthy says, well, you can't just continue down the path of spending and adding to the debt. And if people want to make a debt ceiling for a longer period of time, just like anything else, there comes a point in time where, okay, we'll provide you with more money, but you got to change your current behavior, right? So 
in the fall, Kevin McCarthy had already said he was going to go all in on this. And Mm -hmm. now people are like, oh, you know, the Freedom Caucus really convinced him that he has to go all in on this and he's going to have our back and la, 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 la. But in reality, he was already all the way there. And then people point to, oh, they got committee positions. But a lot of those deals were baked before they got there. And also a little bit meaningless, right? They got three people added to the rules committee. It's basically like rearranging chairs at a party. They they got things, but they didn't really get meaning that meaningful of things. And the, the reason why the motion to vacate McCarthy really held out on that one. It was because it was one of it's one of the tools of like getting rid of him, right? Self preservation instincts are great with McCarthy, and he was like, "Well, you know, that was one of the things that spurred Boehner to leave." Was when Meadows had filed a motion to vacate against him. Long story short, I feel like the wins of the Freedom Caucus here have been overblown to make them seem they were like they were really incredibly freaking powerful and they really they really changed the game with all of their demands that they won when in reality a lot of these demands they had they were already agreed on i want to go back to this article that came out right while all this was happening with the freedom caucus about the organizing body that planned this intervention from the freedom caucus called cpi the conservative partnership institute which one of their senior partners is mark meadows who you know, high up in the Trump administration, former lawmaker who filed the 2015 motion to vacate that led to John Boehner's removal as speaker. But Mm -hmm. I was interested in in this article because the way, so what this this article said was they all met in November, these far right lawmakers with CPI, and their whole goal was to figure out how to make their block into its own kind of political party within a political party. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is pretty high level organizing and thinking by the far right to use their leverage as a block. But I'm curious what you thought of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the CPI, I think to make a long story short with the, the this proposal about turning Congress into this parliamentarian system, they, you know, they're not proposing anything new, right? They're they're not out here joining the hashtag proportional representation caucus and trying to change the way the two-party system rules this country and bringing about systemic change so that there could be a third party. They're just giving us the exact same freedom caucus and now couching it in this language of creating another party. Because they're not proposing leaving the Republican Party. They're not actually like trying to bring about this massive seismic shift in what is U.S. politics. Mark Meadows is just propping up the Freedom Caucus, the thing that he was the one of the OG creators of. So it, to me, is just another way of Republicans finding reasonable sounding language to actually destroy democracy. I feel like it's basically a front to be taken more serious right now, is that they're couching hmm. their destruction of the institution as being thoughtful and we want to bring back more democracy and we want to democratize the institution that is way too top heavy and like leadership has too much power all of the things that all of us say and believe in even as lefties right and i think they're using that as the just mirage this is not very real even this act of what they just did was not really couched in any outcome other than to showcase that kevin is at the mercy of these people which he was already before he willingly gave away the store long before they got to january 3rd and it was just like a final act of like really humiliating the guy well i was gonna ask you know obviously there's an incentive from you know, MSNBC, CNN to be like Kevin McCarthy is a tool of the far right and, you know, sort of Mm -hmm. Donald Trump and blah, Mm -hmm. blah, blah. But there's this whole infrastructure around the far right in Congress led by CPI. They're obviously all doing this for a reason. And do you think that they actually built power from this moment to live another day? Or do you think having Trump come out against them, which he did, led them to have less power? I mean, Matt Gates brought the entire media to talk to him every day and Lauren Boebert for like hours. 
So I'm curious, you know, I, I am curious on your take of, you know, they might not mm-hmm. have wanted anything substantively, but for their individual power going forward, uh-huh. does this infrastructure yeah. network grow from here or lose from here? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. So I, I feel like we have to quantify what power means, right? I feel like this is the fundamental and fatal difference in what we are trying to do and what they're trying to do. For conservatives... Ultimately, right, their goal of small government might not be fully achieved. I feel like they've they've sort of given up on actually genuinely reducing, and we know this, they don't actually care about the deficit and they don't necessarily care about policy. And I think they realize, okay, maybe we don't shrink, quote unquote, the government, but what we do do and do well is have people lose faith and government's ability to just function and to do anything, right? So ultimately, anytime the Freedom Caucus pulls off acts where they shut down the government, they hold the speakership in the House you know, right. hostage for, for days, all of these acts ultimately serves the true conservative Republican end goal of proving that government should not be big, should not exist, and cannot provide any social services or do anything of importance. And so that end goal really is easily achieved with what they do. Your point about democracy and government is really important because, you know, if mm-hmm. if Matt Gates and Lauren Boebert are essentially leading like a neo-Confederate fascist movement or, you mm-hmm. know, like the goal of the Confederates and of fascists is to use the language of democracy to destroy democracy and undermine mm-hmm. democracy or use the tactics mm-hmm. of democracy to prove mm-hmm. that democracy doesn't work. And so mm-hmm. I think it's important. I think it's really important. That point is really important to like bring into light that even though they're using the language of democracy, what the outcomes they're seeking are, sh- are shutting down the government, going after, uh, defaulting you know, on the debt, <laughs> de- defaulting on the debt, you know, doing w- witch trials of Democrats, investigating the January 6th, com- like these are all fascist, neo-Confederate right. things. And they're couching it in the language that might seem reasonable and appealing when you couch it in this, oh, we're seeking this parliamentarian, more power, power shouldn't be absorbed in leadership, all things that sound really solid and familiar to us on the left. And it's the same tactic that Newt Gingrich used in the the 80s and 90s when he used the language and fought on behalf of ethics reforms in the House, right? And he ultimately brought down a whole like Democratic majority and a speaker, Democratic speaker by going after p- folks aggressively on the ethics and getting good government governance like organizations to join him on that crusade. And I think that exactly what you said is the thing that really makes me very worried when people start believing that these institutions like the Conservative Partnership Institute actually care anything about this reform. They don't care about yeah, Mark they Meadows want to make does the, not care about They want about to make reform. the terrain more friendly to Republicans winning the 2024 presidential election or undermining the results of those. Oh, undermining the results 100%. And- I mean, their play, according to this article, their play was that if they stack the rules committee, they would therefore control the Republican Party if they had enough people on the rules committee, which I, I don't know enough about the rules committee, but I'm not sure that that would have resulted in them having the amount of power to do whatever they wanted. But it is an important piece of infrastructure that they have. I never, I had not heard of Conservative Partner Institute before. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think in general, for me, I will always look at what I think in general is the biggest learning lesson for us from the right is their infrastructure building capabilities. And like their, the fact that CPI you know, came on the scene. And, you know, it's not just that they had this idea and then they have discourse on Twitter and then maybe the right people see it or maybe they don't. They actually Mm -hmm. have an organization that has a Capitol Hill townhouse, you know, and it has this TV studio. They have podcasts that they are putting on for these people. They are, you know, they are literally creating an entire universe to support the, you know, the next big destructive thing the right wing can think of. And that is really impressive. It's more so than they raised $20 million in their first year. Right. And I mean, you know, they take 
that old, good old oil money and all the other corporate <laughs> money. But <laughs> I think the inclination to just infrastructure build on the right has always surpassed the infrastructure building instinct of the left writ large. You know, I think we build around moments and we build around people and they build long-term infrastructure. And I think that's the biggest lesson that I think we got to internalize more. Always be building. So I, I want to I want to bring out at the end of this conversation: Are there lessons to learn from this block, this far right block for progressives, for the left, for the squad? Yeah, I think you know this will sound really rudimentary, but some of the things that are important tactics and lessons to learn from just the Freedom Caucus and all of its iterations is that a they regularly meet, they are in communication and they have, I, I think the thing about the Freedom Caucus in general that made it powerful was the fact that outside of the nine members who were the founders back in the day, people don't know who's in the Freedom Caucus. They don't make their list public and just have to play a guessing game based on who their PAC side endorses and hmm. how they vote on things. What's important about remaining anonymous? Oh, I, I, I think that it allowed the Freedom Caucus to stand as a caucus versus becoming really about individual members. There were flamethrowers who definitely became sort of the faces, but those were the nine members who were the founders back then. And then also now it's harder to just like pin down anybody when you don't know who's actually part of this, like this invite only mm -hmm. caucus. So all people could say is that they had somewhere between back in 2015, like 30 to 40 members. Now I think it's like they have about 29 to 30. Yeah, yeah. So part of it is know, the members. smoke and mirrors of it. So it's the smoke and mirror, mm -hmm. right? Do you have 29 people? Mm -hmm. Do you have, and they, they had like formal rules of, you know, 80% of the caucus had to be aligned for them to take an official position. Mm -hmm. But that part was less important because people never knew exactly if an action was a sanctioned position. So they, I, the smoke and mirrors really helped them build up the image of this like larger than life caucus. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it's like a lot harder to pick off one by one. Yeah. And it's also, you know, another thing I'm hearing from all of this talk or getting from this talk is this this is almost a decade into the making um oh three decades three yeah if you three, go back to Gingrich, yeah. The making. Yeah. but also you know just with the launch of the tea party and kevin mccarthy and the house freedom mm -hmm. caucus oh yeah and i think you know one thing that sometimes the twitter discourse forgets is that pelosi and jeffrey still have pretty favorable ratings in amongst the Democratic primary electorate, which is not true of Kevin McCarthy and the Republican primary electorate. And so for like a Jamal Bowman or a Cori Bush to essentially do what Gates or Boebert did to McCarthy, you know, they would be getting a lot more angry. Like the electorates are just fundamentally very different. Oh, the electorates are super different. Yeah. Like you would need, you would need over. Rachel Maddow and like the largest unions right. in America supporting Bowman and Bush right, to and the, 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 not just the individual Democrats being popular, Ugh. but the Democratic elect electorate does not want like they do not favor destructive quote unquote fighters. You're not going to get rewarded for like holding up government business for three days. <laughs> well, you would need to you would need voters, to build the infrastructure. Over you would years have to right to do that. Right, you would have to build the infrastructure that literally explains and supports this action as like the right action, which does not exist yeah, yeah. right now. And the other thing that just is is so easy to brush over, but is a fundamental is at the core of what they are doing. These tactics is that now they had with this action, they had 20 members who voted against Kevin right. over and over again. But in general, the Freedom Caucus in 2015, they had 30 to 40 members when they first decided, oh, we should do something about Republican leadership and we actually have some power when they had a membership of 30 to 40 pretty hardwired. We are down to throw down members. Yeah. Now they have 20. And we are on the best day somewhere between six and eight. <laughs> right. And I, you're I saying there's a really big difference between six like and there's eight. There's a 30. really just there's a massive there's yeah. just a universal difference between mm -hmm. these numbers that cannot be overstated as like a a flaw in anybody's argument when they say oh the squad should do X Y and Z, and when it got down the last couple of rounds like I think the last 
two rounds or so. When it got down to five, six holdouts, when it got down to that number, it went quick. It, w- it went very quick, right? Because it's five to six people, you take them in a corner and the pressure and the trade-offs and the sweet talking changes when you're that number versus when you're in the double digits. And, yeah, yeah. you know, at that point, a call from a call or two from Trump really did move the needle. And I'm also not super convinced he didn't like he supported McCarthy, but I think his support level changed by the time he felt like McCarthy was maybe adequately humiliated because I feel like Trump Trump could have he took his time. He took his time. He, <laughs> Mark Meadows and Trump are, you know, they're homies. So I, I don't think there was that much divergence between what they were trying to do. Well, thank you so much, Amira, for this session of Amira Explains It All. Mm-hmm. I learned so much about the Freedom Caucus, what they won, what they didn't win, what was perception, what was power. Sometimes power is perception. Sometimes power is power. And so <laughs> yeah. breaking, breaking that yeah. down. Yeah, happy to. Well, we're about to talk about one of the new members in the next session. Yes. Summer Lee goes to Washington, baby. I'm back. Mira's back for the second half. I ditched Waleed and brought along some new friends in the DMs today. We have a really special guest. I mean, we have two special guests, but we have one really special guest. Uh, We have Emma Desau, our media director, with her debut on block party and of course our returning guest you know returning to the mic you see him on twitter you see him probably on instagram too none other than jeremy flood our lead video producer as we promised at the very top of the show we're gonna bring many more folks on staff from the jd ofj multiverse onto block party to talk through all of the incredible skills and projects and behind the scenes work that we do to make this all work so emma how are you doing i'm all right how's your break oh my break was was good it was pretty good i got like horribly um ill at the end and lost my voice it's back now though so that's cool you took us on a journey there. You said, it was good. It was good. Came down with a terrible illness. <laughs> you said it in this tone, but the words you were saying sounded awful. Um, and Jeremy, Jeremy, how are you doing? What's I'm doing word? fantastic. Thanks for having me on the pod. So glad to be here. <laughs> Always a pleasure. A confident sounding young, young man. <laughs> Oh, this isn't my first rodeo, you know? <laughs> been here before. Jeremy's been on here before, and he's he's always ready to suggest we take on to the streets. All right, you guys, we brought you all on the podcast to come and talk about a very special video, a special day. And with special, I mean just bad shit, crazy shit that <laughs> happened all in one day. And you guys were there with your cameras, and I'm so excited to talk about it. So The Summer League goes to Washington video. You guys came and you followed summer on what was supposed to be her first day in congress and her swearing in i want to hear from both of you what brought you guys to pitch this video in the first place what was the origin story we were thinking about how to commemorate summer's first day in congress hadn't done a video actually on capitol hill yet and we had a really good time making summer's launch video and working with her and getting to know her better She's just super charismatic and like kind of fun off the cuff to to listen to. So we were thinking about what what her reaction would be to her first day in Congress and weren't totally sure what we could get and not get access to, but thought that if we could just get ourselves and our cameras onto Capitol Hill on January 3rd and kind of follow her around and do sort of like a follow doc in the style of such renowned men's magazines as GQ and and other uh, <laughs> Vogue. Vogue, know. yes. So yeah, we had this whole vision of like how the day might go, questions we could ask Summer, moments we could capture. I don't think there's ever been a documentary following somebody on their first day of Congress, at least not that I know of. So what really 
made me want to get you guys on the podcast was that you know, people always get to see your guys' finished product, the incredible, show-stopping, in my opinion, award-winning, as in Amira's awards, videos coveted. that you do for candidates. Coveted. Yeah, very coveted awards. But you n would never know what really goes into making one of these things. And because I had the pleasure of being, you know, sort of the media intern for some release launch video that you made, and I got to see just the grueling like 12 hours like sometimes more days of trying to get these shots so that you can make a two minute video i thought it'd be interesting to not just talk about the day of you guys filming summer's quote unquote first day in congress but also just in general taking us through creating one of these things i would love to hear more about how you go about the start of a project uh well first you have to put on your therapist hat and you just got to learn all this stuff about this candidate and, and, and make them vulnerable and make them feel safe and comfortable talking to you and sharing with you and really developing that trust. And then you take those stories and you take all that time and really try to do the best job that you can to tell their story in a way that feels authentic and real and good and get their buy-in. And then we sit down and we're like, all right, let's write a script that kind of encapsulates the story of their campaign, their themes, the story of their community, and figure out how to attach name to place to face and make sure that their constituents know that they're the person that's going to make it happen for them. So that process uh, is terrible. Uh, it takes a long <laughs> time. Uh, people don't like it when you try to tell their story for them, but they also need to trust your expertise because they're there to run a campaign and they're not video professionals and you need to be able to provide that service for them. So it's really challenging. It's often a very emotional process, but we get through it and we then start writing our script and we start planning out what are the locations we need to shoot in to make this thing happen? How do we storyboard this? Uh, what are the visuals that are going to really connect to this thing? So, you know, if someone is a candidate running in a district where there's a lot of environmental racism, uh, you don't just want to like film them walking down a sidewalk saying this neighborhood has environmental racism. You need to film the smokestacks, right? And once you get your plan together, and you are scheduling it out, you're like, okay, well, we have good light on this day. So that's when we're going to get this kind of shot. All right, well, we don't want to be outside when the sun is highest in the sky because that's going to look like crap. So maybe we'll do this in golden hour at 7 p.m. You get all that down and you go in with a plan. But you're a small team and you're relying on volunteers. <laughs> and you have a very limited window and an extraordinarily limited budget. So sometimes things can get a little bit more complicated. And I think when you're doing small productions like this, no matter whether you're shooting or you're editing, whatever, you always got to have your producer hat on and be able to put out fires uh, and trust in your smart and capable political director, Amira Hassan, <laughs> uh, to be able to dive in there and, and take a hits and keep stuff on track. So with even less information and less access than a typical shoot would entail, we went into the Capitol. And was that both of your first time, like, inside the Capitol? Yeah. Ooh, how was that? You can feel there's just, like, an energy there, you know? It just sort of washes over you. It's like a, there's, like, a heaviness to it. You can feel the corruption and the war crimes <laughs> hanging the like a specter in the atmosphere. It's, it's truly, uh, it's overwhelming. At least in my experience. I don't know. Emma, what do you think? Um, I, I, yeah. Yeah, there's this something very, especially walking through the uh, the, the bowels of the of the, mm. the capital, like getting from one building to the next. You're like, wow, some dark stuff has happened here. But also, I mean, my feeling about especially being in the Cannon Building, which is where Summer's mm -hmm. office was, was I was like, mm -hmm. I guess I knew this, but it didn't really occur to me how weirdly high school this whole thing feels, mm. where you're like oh, everyone's name is just, like, on the door, and they just have their little corner, but they have to, like, share a bathroom. Like, like AOC's office is next to Dan Crenshaw's office. You're just like, what? But it's just, like, going to the bathroom, 
washing my hands thinking, what awkward mean girl high school moments have happened in these halls of just being like, I hate you. <laughs> or mm-hmm. <laughs> that's how I felt. I was like, this is giving me like real high school vibes. And especially because things did not go as planned and everyone was in the gallery and not in their offices as as, mm-hmm. as we thought. It was just like a lot of pe- people's staff and families and stuff like mm-hmm. hanging out and, you know, something very like, yeah, very funny and familiar, but in this like alternate universe. In a dark way. way. Yeah, in a dark alternate universe. Yeah, way. like, yeah. I love both of these descriptions because, yes, it definitely feels like a very dank and um, dark middle school that just has bad energy and too many hormones flying about. So you both mentioned this and obviously people know things didn't go as planned, which I'm sure changed your guys' production schedule and what you had plan to do what did you guys end up getting to film tell me more about the day of filming and yeah so so the 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 day started early because the congressional black caucus does its own sort of swearing in ceremony off off campus which summer was going to and we had a plan to catch her coming out and then you know get in the car with her and follow her to the capitol and we were standing in the wharf area in DC waiting for her to come out watching all the other uh congress people come out and uh she didn't come out she didn't come out for a while and then eventually we got a phone call from another of our wonderful co-workers and producers Alona who's amazing mm-hmm. that she had already just dropped summer off at the capitol <laughs> so we're like uh <laughs> Okay, she just went out a different door. I see. Okay, cool, cool, cool. But we did eventually get to the Capitol. I I dropped off Jeremy and Sean McCoy, who was our other videographer for the day, who's awesome. They ran (laughs) into Cannon Building trying to find Summer. I searched for parking in D.C. for a long time. And it was also... It, obviously, it was the you know supposed to be the the swearing in. It's the start of the new Congress technically, and it was also they had just like that. It was the first day they had reopened campus and like house offices for anybody to go into. So the lines were just like ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It was a very very busy 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 day. So you know, not the easiest place to try to swiftly get into and find the congresswoman so you guys get past all of that you get inside and then you swiftly find the office right (laughs) yeah so we get inside we find out her office number and it turns out she's not there because she has to run to the floor to vote for the speaker uh so we are sort of standing around and all of summer's family comes as well we get to meet all of them it's really nice we're filming with them in summer's office patiently waiting for this speaker vote to get over so that we can resume finally <laughs> filming Summer's first day. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we did that for hours, just hours <laughs> waiting, watching the chaos unfold. Just like a moment where like the second speaker vote is clearly not going to go through. And I'm just looking at Sean like, bro, we're never going to leave here. We're going to be here forever. Get cozy, save your battery. There was something very fun about watching C-SPAN. Like, I know everyone sort of enjoyed watching C-SPAN that week because C-SPAN, for those who don't know, usually is very restricted in the shots that they can get in terms of, like, they have to stay on the front of a house. But because the speaker hadn't been elected yet, they can just do video stuff and capture bizarre interactions, which I think a lot of people experience through, like, memes of, like, AOC and Paul Gosar talking. But it was kind of hilarious to be like sitting in summer's empty office that is not really personalized yet watching c-span happen only like less than a mile away and just like seeing the chaos sort of unfold and being like are we in purgatory like i think we're just gonna be (laughs) here forever i like there's no end in sight I would say that, like, Amira, you warned us before we got to D.C., like, there, Pete, there are rumors that this is going to happen. McCarthy does not have the votes, so this is going to go on for a while. But I think I just, like, didn't fully realize that there's just an, they'll just vote forever. Like, I was like, so at some point, like, something has to happen, right? Like, they're just, they can't just keep voting. He's not going to get the votes. Like, what else happens? It's just like, no, that it's just going to keep going until someone breaks, <laughs> something breaks. 
so yeah, so we were there for a very long time. But eventually, Amira, I think it was sort of your idea that you were like, you know what, you guys should just like try to get as close to the gallery as possible because, you know, it's vote four or five at this point. Like they're going to have to. I think to- it was like. Later? I seven? think it was like three. three? No, no, no. Oh, okay. You got, no, no. They, <laughs> well, I lost the first day, They only got to like four, I think. First day was that. three. But. It was like it was three, three, yeah. So really? this is yeah. no, yeah. It just felt like a really long day. <laughs> I love the way you're like a purgatory was a really I'm like, like it we was were there ten forever. Bucks the first day, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I I think I was like, okay, we are probably not gonna get. This is gonna go for a minute. They most likely are. They're not gonna adjourn for the day until they really adjourn, and that won't happen till like the evening. And I was just like, let's do our best to see if we can capture any of these members going in and out of the the floor because most likely even though they are not like leaving and going back to their offices you know people will step out they're gonna get bored they're gonna go get like a quick snack before their name gets called right and i was like maybe we can capture them in between these votes yeah we got a new game plan which involved wasi summer's chief of staff wasi who's great burning us down shout out to wasi thank you wasi to the, uh, I will just refer to it as the bowels of, of the cap of the yeah, capital, the, ca- the catacombs, uh, the catacombs, <laughs> um, also known as the basement tunnels. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Nobody tells you that that like the U.S. Capitol is just like connected by like a really long, the British are coming ass catacomb <laughs> section of just like rock and mortar, and it's yeah. just like. I will say that, and I, I, I have to say, like, my recognition of it was, like, from footage from January 6th, where I was like, oh, this is how they got around. That's <laughs> where we are. Weird. Okay. Um, I, I didn't know where we were going the entire time. It is a, it is a complete <laughs> maze. I put my entire trust in Amira, and I also was overwhelmed with the feeling of like, oh, on January 6th, I would have been fucked. I would have, I would have not known where to go. Anytime you turn a quarter, there could have been some white supremacist assholes. It is like a, it is a truly, it is designed to fuck you up. Yeah, it is. That's why it was so shocking. So many made it to very specific locations because it is very difficult. It's hard to find anything. Inside job. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways, we're re- <clears throat> weird, yeah. of course, but we walked down the really long tunnel that Jeremy was describing, and we got to like the next gatekeeper. It's like there's little. It's like, it's like a video game. Like you get to the next checkpoint. Get to the <laughs> checkpoint. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this guy was the first guy who was like, "What are you doing? Are you family of a congressperson? Why are you going here? Whatever." Wasi sort of talked to them. The guy was still pretty, the guard was still pretty skeptical. And then Ro- Alex Rojas, our, our fearless executive director, kind of just like pulls up and is like, we are here to document this historic day as new people get sworn into the 118th Congress. And we just want to be there for documentation. And we were let through the tunnel further, where we eventually ended up at a members only elevator. That was quite small, and we just shoved all of our bodies <laughs> into the elevator and rose up, and like the doors opened into the like little area right outside of where the vote was happening. And it, I was like, I was disoriented when we got out of there, Jeremy. I don't know if you were clear on where we are. I, we kind of like uh, no tum- yeah, like tumbled out of the elevator, and I was like, where are we? <laughs> it's like kind of can hear the muffled sounds of what's happening on the floor and it's like are we right outside of the vote like the answer was yes we were right outside of the vote and that that's when capitol police started being like okay wait, why are you here <laughs> what are you doing you can't you can't be standing here it, well then at we were told by that capitol police officer to go walk down to the rotunda and that we could oh. stand there so this guy um. is like okay well if you're gonna be here just be somewhere else so we walk down to this area and we're in, you know, this hallway and trying to sort of be inconspicuous, you know, like, which is, you know, difficult because we got big ass cameras. We're just trying to, you know, and then who do we see but one Jamal Bowman <laughs> who was just like, hey, Rojas, what are you guys filming? And we're just like, oh, no, man, chill. And he's just like, you got the cameras here. What are you filming? You filming a documentary? <laughs> You know, we're just like, yeah, we're just, you know, we're kind of here to see Summer Lee. She's like, Summer Lee gets a documentary? What about me? 
what about the black man? <laughs> we're just like, he just starts going, right? And we're just like, oh, man, oh, shit, they got us now. And then Summer comes out right at that moment, and he's like, Summer, get over here. And, you know, they're kind of talking about how we have all the cameras. <laughs> so as we're talking about that, then we just hear Jamal just like, Alex, get over here. And who comes along except for AOC? <laughs> who just walks down and it's just like, I heard yelling. I don't know if it was like good yelling or you guys were fighting or what. <laughs> and so we're filming, <laughs> we're filming with her and he's just like, Alex gets a documentary. Summer gets a documentary, but no documentary for the first black man to be a justice Democrat. So I guess we're, we're, you know, I'm prepping in my head. Okay. Well, what's the Jamal Bowman documentary going to be about? Like, what, <laughs> when are we going to get access? the feedback? Yeah. Let me into the office. We'll talk. Right. And then who comes walking down the hall next, except for one speaker of the house, Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> just as Jamal is carrying on, he just like abruptly stops and goes, Speaker Pelosi. And you can just see like AOC jump, <laughs> like panic because he's just directly behind us. And I couldn't help but notice. <laughs> I couldn't help but notice that both she and Speaker Pelosi were wearing the exact same jacket. Just the same vibe. It looked same great. Same jacket. And then also at that point, like, we had kind of amassed, like, a crowd. Like, it was like the three of them were talking. Bowman's mm-hmm. kind of yelling. Everyone's, like, laughing. Mm-hmm. But then, yeah, like, all these other Congress people and their families are walking by. Reporters are walking by. Like, just, it got, it, it was just chaos. Just adrenaline pumping chaos that went on for quite some time and, like, trying to figure out where we should go next and the Capitol Police are certainly paying more attention because of how loud everyone's being <laughs> and we're like oh, how much longer can we hang at, like can we hang on for dear life and then eventually that dissipated and then we got a moment with Cory Bush and and Summer talking which was also really nice and that's about as far as we got before like I would call it like, the big boss of Capitol Police really mm. was like what are you doing I told you to leave <laughs> Yeah, it was truly a journey. Then we just kind of shuffled back into the little elevator, laughed the whole, just giggling the whole way down, <laughs> laughing back through the tunnels, <laughs> and then went back and waited for summer for, for longer <laughs> until, I don't remember who, but someone motioned to adjourn and everyone in a in a plea of desperation was like, yes, <laughs> let's adjourn. <laughs> we got summer in her office. We got like the some of the shots that had been in that initial shot list, like, Summer in front of her name, Summer sitting at her desk, Summer with her family, and some of the stuff that we had sort of like anticipated. Yeah. And then Alex did a like nice little sit down interview with Summer and reflecting on, reflecting on how she thought the day was going to go and how it feels to, to be being sworn in, even though she did not get sworn in. And also just, of course, reflection on the day and what, what this portends <laughs> the first day of Congress when the speaker is never chosen and therefore no one is sworn in and nothing goes according to plan. Yeah. What stood out to you guys from that conversation between Summer and Alex? I would say a big thing that jumped out to me was how willing she was to acknowledge that like this process is bullshit. You know, the hurdles you have to go through to be the first black woman ever elected to U.S. Congress from Pennsylvania, right? insane and she was just like in 2023 i am the first like pennsylvania is one of the 13 colonies and she was just kind of like yeah like when you come in here there's going to be all this pressure on you to be a certain way to act a certain way to lose your accent right to lose your sense of who you are and where you come from and to you know mold yourself into this other person and i just i love her candor you know i love how willing she is to kind of tell it like it is to be honest about what we're up against, to be honest about like, yeah, like, you know, Democrats are in the minority and as a progressive black woman, she's in the minority of the minority and they're up against a lot. But, you know, she was like, yeah, the work doesn't change. We're still fighting for marginalized people. We're still fighting for the working class. We're still fighting for labor rights for workers. So uh, I respect Summer a lot. I think she's got a certain level of, of grit and and this like confidence about her and about what she is and about what she believes in. That makes me think she's going to be an incredible congresswoman. It really, it sort of makes me reflect on her whole thing about like, don't change who you are when you get here because this place will try to break you down. It made me think about like that moment in the hallway where, you know, Jamal Bowman is like, 
carrying on and having a good time. And people were pressed about it. People were just like, you don't yell in here. Like, this is, you know, you don't like. <laughs> but it sort of reminds me of like gentrification. You know how like white people will move into your neighborhood and then if you're hanging out on and, the soup loud. And, and being loud, they're just like, why is yeah. it so loud in here? We got to ban music mm -hmm. after a certain time. And there's just this, there's certain aspect of white culture that's like, you got to be quiet a lot. You got to be silent. Being loud is bad for some reason. It's like, no, we're bringing life into the capital now. We're electing black and brown people who aren't just going to kowtow to whatever sort of white notions of professionalism and statesmanship are. They're going to be themselves. And I, I respect the shit out of that. So big homie Jamal Bowman. Yeah. No, that's a really nice way to put it. I didn't think about that, but it was hilarious to like see the reaction to Bowman just being himself. Yeah, like he's just himself. I don't know. I think like, I think it's pretty clear from any interaction that I've had with him or anytime you really hear him speak off the cuff. Yeah, it was such a weird, tense situation. And he's just like, I'm here. I am who I am. The reason I'm here is from where I come from. And I'm not going to get here and then change. It's not why we get people like Jamal Bowman and other JD people elected. I like that. I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, I love that. What a what a journey. What, <laughs> what a, a journey. journey. What a time. I can't wait for people to see the finished product. And honestly, this is all so much funnier in <laughs> retrospect. It's hilarious. But in the moment, you know, I feel like all of us are very worried that it was going to be a day of s tape of s us watching C-SPAN. <laughs> so... <laughs> And said it was only okay. mostly that. <laughs> it was only yeah. mostly that. And I was really excited when uh, when you all returned uh, to the to Summer's office. And Jared was like, oh, I think this was like some of the best tape I've ever. I was like, thank God. <laughs> uh, when you guys came back, all smiles and laughter, I was like, whew, okay. A video. There's enough there now. So all really exciting. And I was personally, personally Really excited that more folks from our team got to experience Congress and the Hill because it's one thing to read about it. It's another thing, I think, to like feel mm -hmm. the commotion and the nonsense IRL. So I was really happy that we got to got to do it as a team. Yay, yeah. team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for taking the time to talk about all of your adventures <laughs> and share your knowledge and technical expertise. I'm really excited to have you on more often, both of you. And I will relinquish your time. Thank you so much, Amira, for, for having us thank on. Thank you, Amira. Pleasure to be on the block. Love the block. Bye. 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 All right, that's the show. Our mixed engineer is Rocky Rusu. Our producers on this episode were Sophie Cap. Special thanks to Jeremy Flood, Emmett Desau, Walid Shahid, even though I shouldn't thank him. This is his new gig. And really excited to see you on the block every other Thursday. Bye!